It was not long ago that I was scheduled to speak in a s small church on Sabbath morning. And I had prepared a sermon on how God communicated the gospel to his people through the sanctuary services. So that morning I had prepared that sermon with that in mind. The problem was I was having a hard time sleeping and I know it was sometime just before four o'clock in the morning that I was tossing and turning and saying why am I so miserable about this sermon I believe it and it's clear and people need to understand it but why am I having trouble with it and it dawned on me that the reason was very simple I did not have a framework I did not have a structure and I look back over at that time you know, many decades of preaching, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of sermons. And I could go through my, my mind and I could tick off the sermons that were narrative in nature, that were doctrinal in nature, that were exegetical in nature. And, you know, they were, you know, fine. I thought they had done the best job I knew how. But I had no place where I could, on the framework, hang this sermon here and this sermon and this one and then I could step back and say see it all fits part of this big picture I didn't have the structure and that night I tossed and turned and said something's wrong I'm standing so close to all these sermons that I, I need to find a way to move back and it was tough how, how do I back up and see things from a different perspective? Well, maybe I could, uh, I could look at the plan of salvation from a God's eye view. And I started looking at that and I just said, impossible. I can't, I can't get around that one. So I came back again, looked at it again. And finally I came up with a, a picture in my head that I could handle. And it was a picture of, uh, imagine, imagine that um, you lived on one of the planets where God has a people. And Ellen White tells us that they did have at one time the equivalent of a tree of knowledge of good and evil. But they didn't fall. And so eventually God removed the tree. They had passed the test. They had decided to be loyal. But in my mind, I was saying, here are those people who were friends of the angels of heaven. And they saw the battle that went on in heaven. And some of the people, some of those angels were friends of theirs. Some of them who remained faithful to God and, and others who had gone with Lucifer. And they weren't quite sure that God was just in throwing their friends out of heaven. Now, they look down now on the, down there on the planet where, this planet, where the war ended and the losers were, you know, isolated on this planet. And um, they sat there and looked over the parapets of their planet, watching what was happening here. And in the back of their head, they remembered when they had the tree on their planet, wondering what would happen if I took a bite but no I'm not going to do that I mean that would be terrible who knows what would happen but all of those fears came back when they saw Adam and Eve facing the same temptations they had been facing and asking themselves the question what would happen to them if they took a bite and suddenly they said boy I wonder what God would do I wonder what kind of a God it is that we are serving. I, you know, suddenly you have a picture of God that has a rough edge. It has an unanswered question. So you see, you and I are so close to looking at the plan of salvation in the context of what God offers me. No, no, that's the wrong question. Let's back away and from the context of those unfallen beings who personally knew some of the beings that God had created who remained faithful to him and others that were not faithful and some who they knew were down there on planet Earth 
And they suddenly started wrestling with the big questions. What kind of a God do we serve? You see why I was struggling with this context of being too close? Every time you and I open the Bible, we read the Bible in the context of us. Our sin. Our rebellion. What kind of a God do we worship? What did the cross mean? Do I have the nature of Christ before Adam fell or after Adam fell? So we've got this litany of questions all designed for us to manipulate ourselves into our own place of comfort. We're not asking questions about the nature of Christ. We're asking questions that have to do with how I relate to who's in control of my life. We're too close to the topic. And so that's what I was wrestling with that morning. And I said, okay, I'm going to pretend I'm having lunch up on this planet. And there's a teenager at the end of the table, and he can look down and see the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that night, in my head, I drew the pictures you're going to see now. So when I went to church that morning, I took my notes. When I stood up to preach, I said, here's the sermon I was going to preach. Instead of that, I'm going to preach the introduction to the sermon that I was going to preach. So I got out a flip chart, and I drew some circles, like you're saying. But what I started out with was a straight line. And that is, how would you draw a picture of eternity? I don't know of any other way than to have a straight line and label one end of it eternity past and eternity future. And God's objectives in his creation of all of the beings in this universe, what was his objective? It was one. You see, God loves. And he loves to be with people who love him. Okay, God's a lover. And he never created people, beings, with the objective that they would rebel. On the contrary. That was never his plan. But in order for them to demonstrate love, God had to give them the opportunity to not love. Otherwise, it's not love. So people had to have the choice, and therefore they had to have the right to choose to not love. Otherwise, there is no opportunity to love. So, suddenly, he looked around, and he saw that something bad happened. And that's the rebellion of Lucifer in heaven. And his appeal to his fellow angels, join me. What was he asking them to do? To be your own God. You could put your opinion and decide whatever you want to do. And that gets into the, under, the root of the issue of our understanding of what sin is and how righteousness by faith works. But Lucifer lived it out by putting his own opinion, and the Bible describes it as putting his own throne above the throne of God. So while God could make his rules that were applicable to the whole universe, Lucifer said, oh no, I don't pretend to be God. I'm going to put my throne above yours, however, because I will decide for me. My opinion carries authority for me. And that was the rebellion in heaven. And that came down to this earth. You see, you and I struggle with what is sin. And we have gotten fixated that sin is a behavior in which we do something that God prohibits. Or we fail to do something that God requires. I'd like to suggest to you that is not a complete presentation of the most common type of sin. Most of us don't go looking for bad things to do. Right? No, no, no. We're inherently good people. At least we tell ourselves that. The Bible describes, I think, with extraordinary insight, another picture of sin, and that is there's a way which seems right to a man. Okay? You want it, you, you think about it, you process it. Well, it seems to me this is okay. Makes no difference what the topic is. Whether it's how you dress or what you eat or how you behave or not make any difference. The issue is who's deciding 
who's the authority? And if it's right to you, in other words, if you keep Sabbath for the wrong reason, if you think you keep Sabbath because you have decided it's the right thing to do, you have suddenly started sinning in your Sabbath keeping because you made a decision on the basis of your own opinion. So never forget that as the underlying principle of what sin is. But now I want you to see what happened. As soon as there was rebellion in heaven and now amplified through rebellion on earth, suddenly that line is broken. Eternity has been, has been shattered. God's objective has been thwarted. His desire above all is to have a universe built on love between him and his created beings. And now, instead of God's family held together by love, the devil said, I have a better plan. Each person can do what he or she pleases. The individual trumps God's family. Pretty serious stuff, isn't it? So when this shattering happened, that's the only way I could, only thing I could describe it, it is a detour. There, God did not have the option of pretending it didn't happen. It did happen. And now he was on trial. What kind of a God do all of us worship? He could not ignore what was happening. And so what I've tried to do here is graph, and by the way, I got up in with a flip chart on that morning with just a plain ballpoint pen. This is exactly what it looked like, a big circle. And only I put it in three colors, if for a reason it'll become obvious. The white line is merely, a, if, if, think of it as a calendar, a date and time and it, where an event took place, historically. That's just the white line. But it's more than that because around the outside, we put the blue line, and that is where God communicates to somebody or a group of beings something about who he is in the context of how he reaches out to extend the option of salvation. So it is, it is an intention to communicate something about God in the context of the gospel. All right, the, the third one, the red line on the interior, brings the element of prophecy. And you cannot be a Seventh-day Adventist, and frankly, you can't be a follower of God if you ignore prophecy. God communicates so much about himself to the entire universe by his use of prophecy, they understand God's fairness because of the prophetic element. And most Christian denominations today downplay or manipulate prophecy into almost no relevance. So let's take a look now in the context of how God has dealt with it, us from the time of the loss of Eden until eternity future kicks in. And looking at it in the context of those three lines that go around this, this circle. Look at the first thing that happens. Adam and Eve sin. They are immediately put outside the garden. They are separated from God. They used to be able to walk and to talk with him. Now they can't. You have an agonizing, heartbroken Adam and Eve. I mean, they thought that everything was ending because of them. And I thrilled at what God said in that brief conversation. Remember that he had, he didn't talk to Adam and Eve. He, he talked. To Lucifer. He said, oh, you, Lucifer, you think that your way of government is going to revolutionize the whole, the whole universe, that your system is better. I got news for you. You're not going to be riding in on a white horse. You're not going to come in as a conquering hero onto one of these other planets with your system. On the contrary, let me tell you, it was a read my lips moment. I, this woman, She's not going to worship you for the freedom you provided her. On the contrary, there is going to be a state of antagonism, of animosity between you and her. Beyond what you can imagine, that is going to be the characteristic that overrides that relationship between you and Eve and her descendants. Mm -mm. 
No, no, no. You're, get off that white horse. You're not going to be there. There's going to be this state of tension and animosity between you and her. And furthermore, oh yes, you're going to cause all kinds of misery and aches and pains. And they'll curse the day you ever did this because of all the agony you're going to cause. And it's true. She's going to hurt in all of her descendants. Oh, by the way, you're going to get it too. Only you're going to get it in the head. Oh, you're going to tromp all over her corns on her feet. Oh, yeah, she's going to be hurting. But you, it's fatal. The day will come when you are ended and all of your followers. So the first, without a large theological explanation, he comes right to the point and says, here's what the last chapter of the book is going to look like. And he didn't say it only for his benefit, but for Adam and Eve. And it says, there's a way out. There is hope. Trust me, I'm still a God of love. And the whole universe studied about it next Sabbath. And their Sabbath school lesson time. As they looked at what God had done and what God had said. Because remember, they had reservations about who God was. In the next Sabbath, they said, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what God's going to do. There's hope. Wow. There's got to be something exciting here we don't quite understand. And so everybody sitting forward on the edge of their seat was watching not God's seminar, but rather his sandbox with sermon illustrations that he kept cropping up. And there are jillions of them throughout the scriptures. So all we can do is pick out just a few of them. Look at the next one he did. He said to to Adam and Eve and their offspring. I want you to never forget that when you sin, you cause horrible pain. Never forget it. How do, what am I going to do so you won't forget it? Uh, I want you boys to bring your whole family, each one of you. When you sin, you bring a baby lamb. You confess your sins. Your guilt can be transferred from you, the guilty, to the innocent lamb. But then you must take the life of that lamb. And Cain said, but it seems to me, hint, whenever you hear that, it doesn't make any difference whether you're here in the Sabbath school class or any place else. When you hear somebody say, in the context of anything religious, it seems to me that's the time to say, stop. We're not voting on truth. Your opinion is totally irrelevant. So don't waste our time with it. We are here not to vote on truth. We're here to look at what God says. And God said, Eve, I mean, said to Cain, your sack, your gift of your tomatoes and watermelon do not communicate what you have to learn. You're my problem. You cannot design your own plan of salvation. And the rest of the universe said, aha. Uh -huh. And they wrote it down. Next Sabbath. In the Sabbath school lesson time, heaven's sacrifice was foretold. But now there comes a biggie. There's so much that happened between these two, but the highlight. Remember Jesus kept talking about as it was in the days of Noah? So shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What was it he was talking about? Number one, he was pointing out that when man runs away from God, is unleashed and ignores God, Things always go downhill. Guess what? You can prove it almost any direction than the compass you point around, north, around this world. People turn their backs on God. Things go downhill. Just as bad as it was in the days of Noah. But that's not what God was saying. He's saying, when it gets bad, I'm, I'm not forgetting you. I have a way out. And so he put this crazy old man on top of the hill saying stuff that was utterly ridiculous to anybody who had three brain cells to rub together. And he said something that was 
totally ridiculous and rejected by, by the community at large, but the rest of the universe could watch what Noah was saying. And he was saying, when God says, get in the box, you get in the box. What other people say is irrelevant. When God says, get in, get in the box. Your opinions about what it means, ignore them. You see, there was a major message God was communicating, and that is, there will always be a way out. There's going to be a way out, but it's always based on two things. You have to choose to believe above, put your choice of believing above your own rational thinking. Your rational thinking will always be wrong. You must choose to believe what God says and put it above your ability to think rationally. And so it has to be faith-based and it must be choice-based. You can talk about it all you want to. You can stand up and join no one preaching it. But if you do not put your feet inside the box, you are going to drown. There is no substitute for basing an action on faith. You must choose, and it will always be, always be politically incorrect and unpopular to do what God says. That's the test. So if you feel like you're being caught up to be like everybody else, we cannot be elitist. You don't know. You, you must be. It's not an option. If you follow what God says, you will always be flying in the, fest, in the face of that politically correct thinking. That's part of the test. Faith-based and choice-based. And the rest of the universe said, oh, I got it. And saw how many stayed out and wished they had a flotation device. And they had ignored. They didn't like the one God provided. Faith-based and choice-based. And the next thing we find in the narrative is the price of salvation. God said to the universe in a way that we, they could never forget. He said to them, watch my servant Abraham. Watch how many years he's been praying for and his wife had been pleading for a baby. No, no, not ready yet. I want to make sure that the message gets out that I'm doing it, that I am doing it. It's not something they did. I did it. I waited till they could not do it. So it's clear, I did it. It's an evidence of my love for them. I'm in charge here, not their opinions. So much so that Sarah said, you... Who me? You, you've got to be kidding. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where God wanted her. And down comes from God's glory, comes this beautiful little boy. And the purpose of the little boy was not only to demonstrate that God was in control, but his audience wasn't really Abraham. His real audience was sitting around in all those inhabited planets watching who is God. They got the message of God's love, but their mouths dropped open in shock and agony when he snuck out of the house without telling his wife. And they overheard the conversation when God said, take your boy and take some fire with you and some wood with you and go up to the top of Mount Moriah. And they heard when Isaac said on the way, Lord, uh, Father, here's, a, here's the wood and here's the fire. But where's the sacrifice? And a heartbroken father said, God will provide. And the universe out there said, it can't be true. The message was for them, not just for Abraham. It was so they would get a picture 
picture of the price of salvation, of giving people the opportunity to choose again. You see, when Eve chose, they could not make that decision. If they want, God now is going to give them a choice again. But the price is huge. And they watch it happen until God stays his hands. And there is a universe-wide sigh of relief. Oh, wow, what in the world is God telling us? How was he going to pay the price of this magnitude? They couldn't get it. But God wasn't done yet. The only thing he failed to do is provide a systematic theology on the salvation experience as taught in the desert sanctuary. It was all there. For the first time, God says, I'm going to give you a book, only I'm going to do it in the sandbox. And he walks them through every type of a service and communicates to the children of Israel through the whole system of, of, of sacrificial system and the ministry of the priests all the way through to the Day of Atonement enough so that they had you know at least a few centuries to study and to take a part in their celestial Sabbath school classes trying to understand what it was that God was communicating there in that sandbox illustration of the desert sanctuary. But he offers not only forgiveness, he offers transforming power for victorious living, and he offers an ultimate and eternal eradication of the last vestige and evidence that there was ever any sin. It's gone. Your sins and mine. God. Forever. I mean, the message is so powerful and so overwhelming and so clear. And it's the first time God holds effectively a seminar on soteriology. I'm sure he never used that term on the salvation process. But God knew who his audience was. It just wasn't the children of Israel because even Paul looked back and said, God get, gave them the gospel, uh, but they didn't believe it because they didn't have any faith. So even Paul looked back and said they had everything they needed to know to understand the plan of salvation. But they were trying to put God in their box instead of trying to understand his box. The next step that God says is... You've known all along I'm sending you a Messiah. But I don't want to take any chances that you won't know him when he comes. So he scatters throughout the Old Testament. Scatters all of these major descriptives that encompass not only circumstances, evidence, uh, um, Anecdotes, places, and dangers, and all kinds of stories that he tells them what's coming. Uh, and these start about a thousand years before the birth of Jesus. And they keep coming and coming. And when I first started this graph, I mean, I was putting every one of them, and the whole circle was full of all these various messianic prophecies. There's just too many. And many of them get into the matter of date. I mean, it's, it is overwhelming. Let's put it this way. The three wise men, they could figure out when he was coming, where he was coming, and all the conditions and the date, time, and place of his birth. The Jews couldn't figure it out, but all those heathens, they could figure it out because God made it so abundant and so clear. But it was enough. Remember, who was God's audience? It was not just his people. It was the rest of the universe. Why? He had to tell them, I did everything possible. So that my people would know all the circumstances and they would have no excuses in not recognizing him when he comes. You see, his audience, those who were wondering about him, were not just 
the Jews here. It was the rest of the universe. Who is God? And he did. He gave us so much. There is no basis for not understanding it. And it is thrilling. And finally, finally Jesus comes right on the tick at the right time. The right day, the right hour, the right time of day. He sacrificed exactly on that Friday, the Passover. And they didn't get it. Ah, but the rest of the universe got it. And Satan, oh, make no mistake about it, he understood it perfectly well. Now, why describes the fury of his angelic cohorts when he did not succeed in taking the life of Jesus during his brief years of opportunity. But it is finished. And the part I wish all of us could see. Have, have you ever watched a, a ping pong game? Now, I don't mean on television. I mean a ping pong game or a tennis match. And you stand back and take a picture of one side of the bleachers. They're all watching. What do you see? You watch. This is what's going on. Everybody, they're watching back and forth, aren't they? And the same thing happens right here. All of those who were interested in anything to do with God were looking forward to the Messiah coming. And the, everybody is looking forward to here comes the Messiah. He's got to be coming any day now. And suddenly he's here. And then he's died. And now he's gone to heaven. And what happens? Do they just get discouraged? Mm -mm. No. Their head goes to the other end of the court. Because they move from looking forward to the Messiah and his first coming. And now they remember all the things he said about his second coming. So they look at the other end of the court. I wonder what's coming next. So you have this collective shifting of view. We stand back from our perspective on the bleachers and we watch all the believers shift. Now, the Jews were recalcitrant, that's fine, but everybody else, they're looking at the other end. All the prophecies about the second coming. But there is a point that happens right here. And that is, God says, I don't want you to miss what really happened there on the cross. And he, Paul, in one lifetime, okay, while he's still alive, Paul describes in the book of Hebrews the meaning of the death of Jesus on the cross. And he describes it in the context of the final judgment. When the blood of Christ is ministered in the heavenly sanctuary for us, Folks, how many churches do you know that get this? None. It's just not there. But the book of Hebrews tells us what was accomplished on the cross to make possible the, the eternal application of the blood of Jesus. Now, you've got to go to Daniel and Revelation to get the date. But here, right there in, the, in a few years after the death and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus... Paul records the meaning of the cross, but notice what he does. He places it, not down there right after the time of Christ, he puts it clear down here at the end where the salvation is actually documented. So you have a truth conveyed in the context of an end time event, but done in the lifetime within a few years after the ascension of Jesus. Boy, isn't that incredible? He didn't talk about this happening right now while he was writing. It's, this is coming in the future. I mean, it's a majestic presentation. Because Paul starts the process of straddling. Watch how he does it. The straddling of the cross. The next step are some of the prophecies. 
Now, when were the prophecies we are aware of? Uh, when are those prophecies like the ones of Daniel? When, they, when were they given? About 600 years before Christ. While Daniel was one of the senior officers of the government of Babylon. Daniel 2. But what is the period of time he's talking about? By the way, most Christians miss the point. We are focused on the prophet. Revealing something from God. It's the prophets and so it's a prophecy. No, this is not about Daniel. This is about God. In which God says, no big deal that I'm telling Daniel. That's not the point. Through Daniel, I'm telling you what I am going to do with Babylon. And after Babylon, what am I going to do next? It's not, the issue is not Daniel. Daniel just was the stenographer. The point is, God says, I am in charge. I am saying this, he says, so you will trust me when I tell you what is going to happen. It is about God and you and me and the onlooking universe saying, wow. Yeah, God, you... You told everybody exactly what you were going to do. We've had our focus so locked into Daniel, we missed the point. This is not about Daniel. It's about God saying to the universe, watch, I am going to do this with each of these kingdoms, one after the other after the other. But notice he jumps right from the toes of clay and of iron. He goes straight the rock cut out without hands hitting the, the image on his feet and filling the whole earth and so it was just too much to try to squeeze all the things he wanted to say into that one metaphor that one presentation of an image and Daniel says wow and notice remember Daniel is living in the context of an, of an approaching Messiah that's where he's living I can hardly wait you know, we're sitting and strum our harps by the, uh, uh, singing about the songs of Jerusalem. Uh, why? To, getting ready for the Messiah. We'd love to be there. In other words, they're living in the context of the Messiah's coming. And, and God says, uh, hold that thought, Daniel. Uh, I'm not finished yet. And I got another nightmare for you. And he gives them Daniel 7. He says, lest you are confused, I'm just going to give you the same picture all over again. Remember we talked about country one? Yep, here it is again. Number two, here it is again. It's just a different presentation, but of the same thing. Are you comfortable? Are you familiar with this? Well, yeah, yeah, I see these various governments arising, and now, only, now they're personified by these various beasts. But he says, um, now I'm going to take one section that we didn't talk about before. I'm going to take that one and zoom in on it. And we're going to blow it up so you can see it a little more clearly. And so he talks about this great and terrible beast. Ooh, that wasn't there before. No, we just cut right from the toes straight to the big rock. Now, God says, now right here, I need to insert something. I want you to understand. And he describes this little horn power, what it comes up and what it does and where it comes from. and gives all the characteristics. Why? So that the rest of the universe would know that exactly what it is that God intended to see happen. What was going to take place. And so we would have a chance to look at it if we weren't trying to make up our own rules. And that little horn power comes and what it does do is unite Civil and religious authority. Oh, but God says, <laughs> I'm not through with you yet, Daniel. Hold on to your seat because you're going to get car sick on this one. And he gives them another prophecy. Only this time he doesn't begin during the lifetime of Paul. I'm, I'm sorry, during the lifetime of Daniel. He says, I'm going to go back so it's within your memory from that command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now you can figure out exactly what date that is. So from there, 
I want you to count forward. You're going to get up to 483 years, and that's the time that's been separated for the Jews. That's when I'm going to send the Messiah to Prince. So we got this anchor point. Here's when Jesus is coming. You, Daniel, are living in the context of Jesus coming. So this is 457 BC. You already live in 600. So it's not that far until the date and time when Jesus, the Messiah, is going to come. And he's going to have three and a half years. And then he's going to die. And I've given three and a half more years for the Jewish nation. So now you've got 490 years. Okay, write it down. And then he says, oh, there's one additional part. That date after 490 years, I want you to add 1,810 more after that date. And he says, say what? You've got to be kidding. 1,000. And this is after the Messiah. Ooh, boom, he's out. He passes right out. You know, God had to send him, you know, the EMT squad down there with a bucket full of cold water, throw it in his face, slap him around. <sighs> What's going on? And now Gabriel said, down, he said, God has sent me to help straighten this out so you'd understand it. You see, God in his mercy starts out by giving Daniel what he needed. The 457 anchor point. You draw a line 483 years. Mm, there comes Jesus. Oh, really? Now we know exactly when the Messiah is coming. Good. Now we're going to add seven more years to that. That's the time for the Jews. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh, I've always wanted to hear that. Now I know. Praise the Lord. I, I, I have got present truth for today. Wasn't this great? And then the Lord says, now I've given you what you want. You got these anchor points. Now I just want you to cite from this one to this one to this one. And then stretch a line out. A long one. Yeah, it goes over the horizon. A long line. I want you to measure that one. You measure another 1,810. And, and that brings you down here to the time of the end. What are you talking about? He, you, we, God just took him completely beyond his vision, beyond his frame of reference. Then he sent Gabriel down and said, let me tell you the rest of the story. When Jesus comes, there's still another shift in people's view. Okay, it's the Messiah and then uh, after the Messiah. They're, they're looking for something else, and that's the Messiah's second coming. And notice, this brings God's dealing with his people and the onlooking universe way down to a concrete point in that line that is so certain because God anchored it at the beginning, and it is not movable. There's no shifting in it. It's concrete, it's measurable. We know that it was in the 15th year of Tiberius when Jesus was baptized and began his ministry. You can't play games with that. You know the beginning and you know these other two dates. There's no shifting. You know exactly when it happened. And the only thing you got to do is say, can you add 1810? To 34. Yeah. Oh my. And everybody puts it out of their head because they're so busy looking at church politics. They forget about it. It's still real. The church may ignore it then. They may have chosen to ignore it. But it doesn't make it less real. Most Christian denominations today say, I never heard of such a thing. I don't, well, why would I believe something like this? <laughs> because it's true. Because God said so. Your, op your opinion is irrelevant. The Bible doesn't play games. If you want to pretend that it's not true, that's your business. Go, you know, if you want to take a, a malox or an antacid, go ahead. Uh, but God's not going to send you 
Gabriel to slap you around the face. He already did that once. Wake up and read and understand what God said. The neat thing is this. God adds another prophecy. He adds a 1260 years. And what do you have? You have from the time the fall of the Roman Empire. 1260 years. Brings it down to 1798. Just a few years from 1844. And God says, please wake up. This is the time of the end. So the prophecies confer, converge. My friends, it's our business to show this to everybody. The prophecies have converged. We are in the time of the end. Your opinions and my opinions are irrelevant. It's God's opinion and that's what he said. You see, it's not the prophecy. It's him telling us what he is doing. It's not about the prophet. It's about him telling us. And he brings it together and there's one other element that is incredible. When you look back at the history of God's dealing with his people, it is startling. As soon, soon after the ascension of Jesus, we were warned, but church began to accommodate truth to their own politics. Every single biblical fundamental belief everyone was either set aside adulterated modified to achieve another objective so the 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 lord's supper what it means set aside how our sins are forgiven set aside and modified so that the authority shifted from god and our confession to somebody else a human who we wanted the church. We. There's only, there was only one primitive church. You can't say it was one type, but it was the Christian church. They set aside how we are forgiven. Set aside which day we worship on. Set man above God. The prophecies disappeared. Every single fundamental belief. Baptism set aside. Made optional adapted to our convenience and we did it in the name of God we crawled up on God's throne and kicked him off his throne and put our opinions in his place and did it as if we were God talk about sacrilege and things went from bad to worse for hundreds and hundreds of years down through all the dark ages. And it got worse and worse. But just like God in the days of Noah, he said, enough already yet. I'm not going to put up with this. Before I wrap things up, I'm going to restore the truth I entrusted to my disciples, I'm going to wrap it up again. And he raised up that simple but humble, dedicated, you know, priest, Martin Luther. And he discovered in scripture, we are not saved by our Say, repeat, counting the rosary and repeating so many Hail Marys or praying to the, pre, praying to the saints. No. No, we're, we're saved. It's a gift of grace. And little by little, every one of the biblical truths that Jesus entrusted were restored one by one. And each time God raised up a person who brought a truth. And people rallied around the teaching of that truth based on scripture. But they tended to stay there. So God waited a while and raised up somebody else and another truth came. You want to know where our denominations came from? It's the reestablishing step by step of the truth God raised up. Men and women of God to communicate something that had been lost. Then at the end of time he did something unusual. He didn't raise up a person. He raised up 
a concept in the hearts of people all over the globe. Study prophecy. I'm coming soon. So all, from all kinds of denominations, people dug into the preaching of God's words with regard of end time prophecies, where we are. And out of that awakening, all over the globe, out of that awakening, this simple group of humble believers who spent more time on their knees than in God's word, God restored through them a whole cluster of truths, including the Sabbath and the second coming and the sanctuary. He restored those truths, gave us the message of health, faithfulness and tithes and offerings. He brought these message and he said, your business is to take these last truths, I am coming soon, and take it to every person that breathes. I'm coming soon. Non-negotiable. I mean, it would be just like saying to Noah, you can preach if you feel like it. God raised you up and me up with one message, one purpose, no other. Our mission is not to fill the pews with tithe-paying nice people. No, it's not a balanced budget. No, our, our business is to make sure every breathing being in the area where we live knows the dates are certain. The activity is non-negotiable. Our business is simply saying, God said it. That's enough for me. You need, to, you need to react to it. You can ignore it. But it is nevertheless true. And God, in the most miraculous way, notice what he did. He restored all of those truths step by step. Now notice. All of those truths coming together in the first half of the 19th century. Just when the other prophecies from 1790 to 1844, those prophecies, the timelines are ending. And God is restoring those truths. Do you think there's an accident there? No. You see, the message the Seventh-day Adventist Church has to present is gospel-based, but it is it is also driven by the apocalyptic prophecy that God put in his word to drive us to action and to say to the universe, is there anything else I could have done to get us to move? No. You see, God is on trial. And the issue is, has he done everything possible to awake, awake the sleeping members of this movement? Those who are satisfied with filling, fulfilling the cultural heritage of the religious routines. God was, at the, when Jesus came, he had his most acerbic criticisms for those who pretended to believe and simply fell into the trap of the routine cultural issues. God says to us, don't, give, don't go there. You're deceiving yourselves. Your business is doing what I have given you to do. It brings glory to him and credibility to you and to me when we share what God has given us in his word. It is non negotiable but notice what happens at the right time and we don't know what that time is because you see we are part of God's problem the Bible says that only God knows when the date and time of the second coming is you know why that is because Peter says you and I can change it it's a moving target the more we work, the earlier it becomes. Peter says, we can hasten his coming. Oh, as if that's not enough, you know what we can also do? There's no place in the Bible where we have a map 
a road map of the New Jerusalem. You know why? Because every time someone accepts the message of salvation in Jesus, the Lord's got to find a place for a new house. So he has to have a new road map. So we have an influence on all kinds of things. When he comes and what heaven looks like, what a thrilling opportunity. You see, this is not a figment of somebody's imagination. Like most people that are scientifically hardened by the irrelevant and the inconsequential. God has entrusted to us the privilege of saying, wouldn't you like to live next door to me? Let's pray that God will change the order of the home so we can you know, live across the street from each other or by each other. That's the kind of thing we have the privilege of doing. But I got news for you. Remember the tennis game? We have the shift when Jesus came. Now the great day of the second coming comes. And the Bible describes how those who are righteous, who are dead, are raised up. And they join the righteous living to meet God in the air, meet Jesus in the air. And those who were already wicked and had already died, they remain dead. But those who are wicked and alive, the Bible says, are slain by the brightness of his coming. The nonsense of the rapture is simply extra biblical. It's not there. There's not one text, not one text that supports it. The Bible is clear. There is no confusion. It is ultra simple. He comes, the righteous, caught up to meet him in the air. The dead, they're dust under the feet, ashes under your feet. And so Jesus comes and we're caught up and everybody is ecstatic. We've been looking forward to that ever since the first, the ascension of Jesus. But now our heads have one more snap. <laughs> you see, this experiment with sin is not over with yet. For a thousand years, what are we going to be talking about? We've got a thousand years of answering questions like, what are you doing here? I had no idea you would be here. And whereupon your friend says, hmm, I thought the same thing about you. <laughs> well, why isn't so-and-so here? I haven't seen him or her. I thought they were what? Well, you've got a thousand years to figure out what the answers are. Because the conversation is still about sin and how God dealt with it. Was he fair? And the rest of the universe is listening over and recording it and they're distributing DVDs around to the Sabbath school classes all over the whole universe. You know, I get a little carried away with my metaphors, but you can be sure they are all interested for a thousand years. But my friends, there is one more whiplash to come in this heavens, you know, tennis game. And it comes at the end. One of the most emotion-packed moments in my life it was two summers ago when my wife and I and my brother and his wife went to Patmos and went down into the cave where John the Revelator was held there for 15 years and where he penned one of the most glorious passages in scripture. I don't know that it's possible for me to repeat what I remember of it without weeping. You remember it, and I, John, saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband can you just close your eyes and imagine it's finally over God has moved the capital of this universe to the site of his greatest triumph here and down it settles. And the evil ones rise up, led by the devil. Let's attack the city. And 
and all of us are standing out there looking over the balcony when God, the Bible says, does his strange act. And with weeping, he accepts the decision of the wicked who chose to be their own gods. He, he accepts their decision and fire comes down from heaven. But the best is still to come. Sometime later when the obsidian is still cooling, God says, okay, you didn't get to see it the first time. Now watch as he creates a new heaven and a new earth. My friends, we have a message to give. It is non-negotiable. It is powerful. It is Christ-centered, God-centered. Whether or not we share it, we put our lives, eternal lives, in peril if we choose to ignore it. So I invite you. Say, Lord, here I am. Use me. I don't pretend to be the most eloquent, the most articulate. No, but use me. Here I am. Father in heaven, thank you for the message you've given us. How you have restored, your plans are to restore this universe to what it was before rebellion entered. Use us, Father, weak elements that we are, to hasten that glorious day of your coming, of your, the, the third coming when you restore this earth to its original perfect beauty. In Jesus' name, amen.